Please make yourselves comfortable. <laughs> Uh, my name is Gordon Clark. I'm the director of the Smith School of Enterprise, uh, Environment and Enterprise, um, if I can get it right. And uh, I've been director for nearly three years, and uh, you thought I'd got the title right, admittedly, but there you go. Uh, and uh, in that time, we've been really trying to foster uh, both uh, uh, sponsored research, but also through sponsored research, engaging with a whole range of people, groups in the community and across the world. In that respect, the mission of the Smith School is not only obviously to set the agenda on uh, economy, environment and much else besides, but also encourage and foster a conversation across different groups with a stake in the environment question, whether that be quite obviously climate change, Paris looms, but also other elements of the environment which really deserve uh, equal attention, if you like, in terms of the nitty gritty of the environment, enterprise, society connection. And in that respect, I must say I'm very pleased to make this brief introduction, recognize the sponsors here today and particularly talk briefly about this project, which is so important, I think, in terms of setting the agenda. Smith School is, does deep dive research, big projects, big documents. Equally, we're trying to do... <laughs> this, is <laughs> worry. This, is worry. Uh, this is what he's going to do next. You know? That's why we... <laughs> That's why we employ them. And, uh, but we're also writing uh, reports and engagement uh, uh, letters that basically set out uh, key issues that society ought to and could address uh, in some depth. Um, no no uh, secret to anyone, we're one of the great uh, forces behind the stranded assets work, and uh, particularly Ben here tonight, who will follow me uh, very soon, about that fundamental question which seems to get everybody's attention. Tonight though, we're going to talk about uh, resilience areas, how do we value nature in some sort of profound and integrated sense. And I'll turn it over to Ben, who will give some more life and colour to the project. So once again, it's welcome. Once again, thank you very much for the sponsors that made this possible and I'll leave it to Ben to flesh out the details. Thank you. Thank you all. So, um, thank you, uh, thank you all. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the first public event that we've had as part of the project for Protected Area Resilience um, at the University of Oxford. Um, the project is a relatively new initiative that was set up in early 2014 as a collaboration between Smith School and the Bournemouth School Smith School but also um, Oxford's School of Geography and the Environment. Together with three funders, um, the Luke Hoffman Institute, WWF UK, and the Winchester Trust, um, which is a trust that's been set up by Robin Goodwell and his family, and Robin's here. So thank you, Robin. Um, and we have two uh, collaborating research partners as part of the project, um, Zoological Society of London, and also the United Nations Environment Programme, World Conservation Monitoring Centre of Cambridge. <laughs> the purpose of this event is to uh, present and introduce to a wider audience uh, the work we've done as part of this project um, and also set out some of the things we're hoping to do in the future phases of this work. And obviously we're keen to work with people in the room and people that can't be here today um, to take these, this research agenda forward. Um, now, from the, from the invitation, you might have been um, given the impression that there was going to be uh, hard copy reports you to take away. Um, and unfortunately, due to production, issues, I won't go into them, um, the report isn't available today, um, but it will be available in a week or two, so apologies for that. Um, the, the, the report though simply underpins and provides additional material that, that um, we will cover today, so you won't, you won't be missing out on anything, and you can in fact, you can concentrate more on the presentation instead of flipping through a report. 
Um, so in terms of the structure uh, this evening, so Paul Jepson uh, and myself are going to spend about 40 minutes or so um, going through the work to date and highlighting some of the potential applications of our work. Um, we're then going to have a panel discussion that's going to be moderated by Gordon. We've got three distinguished panelists joining that panel, um, the first of which is Andre Aberdeen from J.D. Morgan, who's head of Global Environmental and Social Risk Management. Thank you, Andre, for the fantastic venue and for all your support. Um, Bill Davies, who's Director of Programs at WWF UK, will also join the panel, together with Theresa Nicholson, who's head of ESG Governance, no, sorry, ESG Research and Investec Asset Management. Um, and each panelist will have five to six minutes to talk about their views on the framework and the work we've done and um, its possible applications, and then we'll have a Q&A and a discussion. And then, after that, there will be canapes through into the next room with drinks. I've looked at the uh, pick the canapes. The canapes may be seriously impressive, so you've got an incentive to stick around. Um, and then we have that every month at about 8.15, 8.30. Um, I should add that the event is being, is being filmed um, and recorded, so that recording will be available in a week or two's time on, on, on the website and on YouTube. Um, that's what people are interested in today. Um, so, so quickly, onto the rationale for the project um, and protected areas and areas and work we're doing. Um, so I think that protected areas as a topic for policymakers have um, in many ways become less of a priority over the last a decade or more. Um, and that's despite the fact they're becoming more important for global conservation efforts, are being used more, utilised more for a range of services they provide, and important ecosystem services they provide, um, and despite the fact also that they're exposed to, despite their importance, exposed to a whole range of diverse threats that seem to be getting worse as well. Um, and the, the IHG targets, which aim for at least 17% of terrestrial and inland water, and 10% of coastal marine areas to be designated in protected areas by 2020, um, have resulted in new gazettements for protected areas, have resulted in the global protected area state growing, um, but I would question whether those targets and, and that framing has done much to increase the funding, the enthusiasm, the effort required to actually ensure that our global protected area state can flourish. Um, so while the debate about targets, expansion of the estate, gazettement is really important and necessary, um, it's certainly not sufficient. And so this project was conceived um, as a process to provide some of the intellectual and research-based foundations required to help reinvigorate the discourse on protected areas. So that's where we're, that was a sort of the original impetus for this. And I think this requires a reframing of protected areas that is better aligned with how we can motivate humanity to do positive things um, for protected areas, whether that's policy makers at different tiers of government, different jurisdictions, or civil society, or businesses, or investors. Um, and I think we need to be honest about the fact that the, the biodiversity conservation, the, the, the target frame, framings are just not sufficient, not working as well as they could be. And I think one, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this is to try and move towards frameworks, framings that can focus on value creation, on stewardship, asset management, things that I think are better able to motivate people. Um, so in addition to this work trying to reinvigorate arguments for protected area conservation, um, we also believe that an asset-based framework can help protected areas achieve three very important things. Um, the first of which is enhanced risk management. We talked a bit about threats before, that's one thing. The second thing is finding new investment for um, well, for protected areas from existing sources of, of, of fund, funding, but also from new sources. Um, and the third thing is ensuring that existing spending, existing funding is delivering better value for money, that you're getting more bang for money. And I think without progress on those three fronts, um, it's going to be hard to sustain protected, protected area networks, it's going to be hard to get the most out of them, and in many cases networks might um, have trouble and, and, and <clears throat> crumble and in some, in some cases possibly fail. So I just want to sort of talk a, a tiny bit more about those three, those three things and some of the related research questions um, that we're going to try and attempt hopefully as part of this project um, in subsequent phases. So, um, in terms of risk management, we need to enhance the capacity of protected areas to monitor and respond to current and emerging risks. Um, 
And if we don't do that, protected area assets could become stranded assets. Um, so that's one connection with the sort of work that we can also do at the Smith School. Um, and the risks that are already placing um, a lot of or significant value at risk in protected areas are things like physical climate change, or the legal wildlife trade, land encroachment, extractive industries, uns unsuitable infrastructure development. Um, other risks, and Paul will touch on some of these, these things later on, land designation, regulatory change, tensions between ministries in, in, in different governments, corruption, conflicts, all these different things um, are affecting protected areas and, um, and, and affecting them over different time horizons. So some of the research questions that we're keen to, to, to explore are what are the risk factors, what's their distribution geographically, how are these risks changing over time, where might they go, um, how material are these risks in terms of their probabilities, their size and potential impacts, how might they affect the ability of protected areas to generate values that are important, um, what are the best strategies to, to manage those risks, what are, the, what are the risk management strategies that have worked before, huge amount of experience in the past about managing some of these things, um, can we draw on some of that, can we expand it. Um, so those are some of the things that the risk management side we would want to uh, look at. Um, I talked about new investment, so um, more funding will need to flow into protected areas for them to, to generate and sustain the value that they, they produce across different domains um, for a range of different stakeholders. Um, and as I said, because of the risk, the increased risk they're facing from a range of different threats, more investment is going to be important to manage, manage those changes. The tradi traditional sources of funding um, operational and capital funding, usually from governments or from conservation organisations, philanthropic organisations, haven't been sufficient so far. Um, it doesn't seem to be likely that they're going to be sufficient in the future, um, particularly in the context of pressures on government budgets in the developed world, but also, of course, in the developing world. So, um, as a result of that, two things need to happen. The first is that the, the, the limited public funds and philanthropic funds that are flowing to protect areas already need to be better spent. Part of that's going to be about concentration and prioritisation of those funds, and particularly where alternative sources of funding are scarce. Secondly, protected areas um, need to think about how they can attract other forms of funding to fund investment in, in, in protected areas and their networks. And how do they develop the competencies, the frameworks to do that? So in terms of that very important area, uh, we're, we're interested in Questions like, you know, what types of investment are required? Where are they required? What scale of investments needed? Um, how is how is existing investment distributed globally? Um, where where has it gone before? What, what are the sources been? Um, which protected areas could attract private capital? Um, which ones are going to be reliant on public and philanthropic sources? Some clearly won't be able to tap into private sources of funding. Um, how should funds be prioritised? Are there unintended consequences associated with um, attracting private finance? How can we avoid them? Um, how can non-financial returns, non-monetary values be financed and by whom? Um, and there are other questions too, but we think that that's an important and very interesting area. And then the third thing, quickly, I talked about value for money, doing more for less. Um, it's really about delivering better returns uh, to your investments. Um, so, as I said, I think that almost regardless of the source of, of funding, whether it's philanthropic, public or private, uh, protected areas are going to have to deliver better monetary and non-monetary returns um, for the investments they receive. Um, and the aspiration should be, of course, that they're delivering more value uh, over time by constantly improving the amount of value that they produce. Um, and so that's one way in which we can help address this um, protected area funding shortfall. Um, and obviously if you demonstrate value for money, uh, whatever the source of the funding might be, you, you can then get into, you can possibly create virtual cycles for attracting new investment by demonstrating to funders, to providers of money and funds that, that you know, as a protected area or a protected area network, you can manage those properly, that you're confident that you're a good source of your investment. 
So in terms of those questions in that area, we want to understand um, you know, what specific measures to help improve value creation in specific closed areas, what evidence is there for, for that, again, what are the trade-offs and relationships between um, different types of value creation, so economic, cultural, social, uh, how might that influence decision making, um, what kinds of approach, what kinds of framing would be useful for improving efficiency, where would capacity, capacity development be, be uh, most, most useful and be beneficial. Um, so each of these things, risk management, new investment and better returns are a focus of the project, uh, and as I say, I hope the project continues for some time. We hope to look at these things as the project grows, but lots of lots of big and important questions that we would hope to tackle in partnership with, with many others. Um, so that's sort of the rationale, uh, quickly. Um, I just want to say a tiny bit about process and the output so far from, from our project. Um, so as I say, we began in early 2014. The publication of the report um, that will come out in, in one or two weeks um, sort of marks the end of phase one of the project. Um, and as part of phase one, we've developed a framework, we've been testing it very thoroughly with a whole range of different stakeholders, we've been using um, online survey, surveys and, and, and iterative Delphi processes to try and test, test, the, test the ideas with, with key stakeholders and people that know about protected area management. Um, we published a working paper late last year, um, we have begun a project, uh, and Paul's leading on this, um, funded by the Brazilian government about how to apply some of the ideas that we've been developing in the Brazilian context. Um, we've begun developing some of the subsequent phases that we might touch on in a bit in terms of getting the data together, starting to develop some of the analytical techniques we're trying to use. Um, uh, Paul has supervised three graduate research projects, um, each of which is applied our framework to different contexts, from the Serengeti to the Mersey Valley, we'll be more on that in a sec. Um, and those will be published, we hope, as working papers over the next couple of months. Um, we've also presented our initial framework to the IUCN World Partnership in Sydney, um, and that's got some international conservation policy backing. You know, the IUCN has been talking about been using our, our asset-based language in, in conversations about protected areas. Um, as part of the process, we've been guided and supported by a project board, um, some of which are here. Uh, obviously, the funders I mentioned um, and, our, and our research partners, so I'd just like to thank them um, for contributing to the project and really making it happen. Um, now, I've been talking a lot about our framework and what it might result in and things like that. Um, but we haven't taken you through it yet, so that's Paul's job. Um, and then I'll come back and talk a tiny bit about some of the investment um, applications possibly. But over to you, Paul. Thanks. Well, evening, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Slightly sad that the blinds came down. I was really enjoying the uh, view from there. So I'm going to uh, present our, our framework, and it's, it's a framework for thinking. I've, I've sat down the uh, in the uh, foyer early and saw that beautiful video of J.P. Morgan which said, was it thinking further? Is that right? Somebody from J.P. Morgan would say yes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh right, I'm in the right place here. So hopefully this is thinking further a little bit in terms of how we think about protected areas, value and risk associated with protected areas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, look at that. I'm going to talk about agency in a moment actually, so uh, there we go. Um, uh, it's a little bit back to the future, I should also say, this framework. So what, what we're trying to do, we're trying to generate new insight about where value and risk resides in a protected area. This is uh, of value to anybody who goes to protected areas, but it's also of value to, or of interest, to those maybe people such as here who are thinking of investing in protected areas, or have investments which overlap uh, protected areas. As Ben mentioned, we're trying to recast and reinvigorate the concept of protected areas as a policy vision and ideal. And, uh, maybe this is the sort of stuff which gets us a bit excited, is um, developing a new generation of decision support tools and guidelines. Environmentalism, 1970s, all the institutions set up then, things are getting a bit old and it's the time to freshen up and move on. Society and policy has moved on, so does our thinking. Should perhaps just talk a little bit about um, you know, putting a new framework out there, 
uh, coming from a university, we always think, well, what are the conceptual resources? What are the perspectives which we're drawing on to conceptualize this framework? If you'd like to say, I'm not going to give you a lecture uh, now, but um, any other time, very happy to do that on this. But I think there's three things I just want to touch on here which are really important to get if, if you're using this framework and when we're uh, using this framework. One is the concept of value. Bloody hell, I mean, we all use value, don't we? But you try and pin down what it actually means, and it's a really complex and slippery thing. If anybody can tell me, you know, one line on value afterwards, I'd be very uh, glad for that. It's a multi-dimensional uh, concept. Uh, maybe in the world we're in, we've got uh, monetizable, financial, and non-monetizable value. We've got valuable, which we compare, and we've got value, which we can't compare. We've got value, which we can put in balance sheets, and value, which we can't put in, in, in balance sheets. We've got values as an assessment of worth. Again, uh, that's what I looked at when I came into this building, JP Morgan telling me its values out there. It's quite a broad uh, concept and something we need to understand uh, with, uh, in this. I have to say, in terms of how this is thinking, I might have, if I'd said this before I'd done this project, I said we might say we have value that can be converted into metrics and value that can't be converted into metrics. One of the things I've got from this work is a realization, well, actually, maybe a lot of this non-monetizable value we can convert into metrics. We just need to think harder and more creatively about how we do that. So it's already changing my thinking. The other <coughs> one is the concept of agency, bringing about in a change in the state of affairs. I think this is something which probably unites us all in this room, from whatever area we work in, whether it's changing the investment of money we've got, state of affairs, we get more uh, return on that, you know, moving from work to employment, uh, as a conservationist I'm very keen in avoiding extinction, for instance. Agency is a change of affairs, but when we think about agency, uh, it's often, we are quite human-centric, we think it's in us as individuals, but of course agency is there, I could knock over that lectern, or I could, uh, you know, trip Ben up or, or whatever, but for most things we're concerned about, most things which we really value, in, in this world. Agency is a relational output or an outcome of relations. Agency doesn't reside in something or someone, it's a, an emergent property uh, within there. I think this is really important when we're thinking about protected areas. It's a no-brainer really, when we start to think about it, you know, the obvious example is, is reproduction. That's a uh, change of state of affairs, a relational uh, outcome. But when it comes to nature and protected areas, uh, and protected area value, and hence, hence returns and risks associated with protected areas, we need to understand that these are relational outcomes. They're co-produced by the complex complexity of context. So that's really important when we're thinking about protected areas, we're thinking about situated things. They sit, you know, they land or, or, or ocean, they're in, uh, in a place. The next thing I think which has really informed our thinking on this is concepts uh, of the frame. The idea that as humans we just have to make sense of that complex world which is out there. And we do that by grouping together ideas, experiences, images, metaphors in frames. And again, we can think of this. We use them all the time, you know, aid, family, work, play, economy, finance, conservation. But these frames, they're, they're individual, but they also uh, collective and sort of represent sedimented ways of understanding and making sense of the world. And some of these frames are really powerful, and they're really powerful in particular domains of society and particular decision-making domains. As we probably know, one of the ones which is quite dominant at the moment in the post-Eurozone crisis is the concept of capital. And capital is increasingly getting applied as a frame to how we might think about nature, protected areas, natural resources, as stocks of something which can generate benefits for economy and people. What this is thinking about, um, <coughs> when I got into this, Gordon will tell you, I've, I've been really annoying in my department over the last year, because I keep, whenever I see an economist, a political uh, geographer, uh, sorry, economic geographer, uh, I say, well, can you tell me what the difference between a capital and an asset is? <laughs> and one of the things I get there is, uh, when we're talking to ec economists, they're saying, Oh, uh, not quite sure. Oh, I think we use them interchangeably. Oh, yeah, but well, it's about long term, it's about flows, it's about stocks. But there's actually, in the finance and economic world, that doesn't, it seems to slip into each other. But when we come out into the human world, 
I think they're quite different concepts. I think intuitively we know that. We have personal attributes which are assets, we have assets which are out and around us. So this is saying that really when we think about protected areas and we think about investment and conservation of protected areas, we need to use the concept of natural assets and maybe more provocatively, that those who are interested in natural resource management and protected areas should be pushing back a little about, uh, about using the term natural capital. I mean, the concept of the frame, I mean, I just, I'll just put this uh, slide together yesterday. You know, when I was thinking of capital, you may think of it differently. Thinking of stocks, profit, these were the ideas which came into my head. Wealth, production, consumption, power, short-term, transferable. Capital can be transferred. When I think of an asset, and again, you may uh, disagree with me, but I'm thinking of attributes, personal attributes, value, property, lifestyle, investment, advantage, long-term, situated earners. It's almost that capital fits within a broader frame of assets in uh, nature and society. Of course, capital aligns beautifully with framings in economy, but it's rather linear. It's about inputs and outputs. Assets, in contrast, is more, it aligns more with other frames we have. Society, life quality, a rich life, those things which really mean something uh, to us all. And it's, all, it's more holistic. It is about inputs, it is about investment, but it's more about emergent outcomes. As we see, you know, cap capital, if we do things in that frame, it can be very positive, you know, we can get some politicians uh, on board, but it can also be antagonistic, anti-capitalism and so forth. Whereas, oh, maybe I'm being a bit hopeful and over sign here, asset seems something which builds consensus, builds working together, builds going forward uh, together. So that's where the, the asset uh, idea is. So you know, they're complementary, of course, all of these things uh, are complementary. <coughs> just before we go on to this, um, I want to just uh, read how a protected area is currently defined, and this definition is replicated uh, in in conservation institutions. Protected areas are clearly defined geographical spaces, recognised, dedicated and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural value. Well, no disrespect to IUCN, where that comes from, but for me, that doesn't give us much to work with in the real world. How are we going to translate that into risk, investment, value generation, management, uh, when it comes to. So, the first part of our framework is say, well, let's just think about protected areas in a different way, in an asset way, in an asset-based way, and suggest that protected areas, they're a spatial asset class. They're out there, they're land, okay, uh, or, or ocean, and they're created through investments in a range of asset types. So, on a protected area, or around a protected area, or producing a protected area, it's a biophysical in the middle, and then a range of different types of assets which are associated with that. And from that interaction emerges value, but also from that interaction can, uh, can create risk uh, as well. So if we think in the biophysical assets, you know, this is the, the nature out there. Um, it might be biodiversity, it might be species richness, it might be ecosystem processes. It's also just amazing landscapes, things which, wow, or incredible species, you know. We've been talking about the Pantanal, well that's a biophysical asset, just highest and course, mind-blowing uh, stuff. But it's more than that as well, when we look at protected areas, we can think of it as a set of four other types of, of, of assets. So one may be, I'll start here actually, the institutional assets, the assets that bring that protected area into, into being. These may be a designation, a legal framework, which actually you know, designate that land for it. There may be management plans. Uh, there may be contracts. Um, some people here are involved in, in red, red plus, and that institutional asset of a contract uh, with a protected area. Other ones which I'm sure we're all familiar with if we've been to protected area are the infrastructure assets. You know, the roads, the trails, the visitor centres, um, the cable cars if you go to uh, down to the Alps and so forth. Then we've also got the human assets, and the human assets are what we call the embedded knowledge uh, associated with the protected area. A range of service would be a very good example of that, but also a history of, of scientific research going in, uh, doing in that research. People can speak for research, speak notably uh, about it. And then we have the cultural assets, which come from 
the engagement over time with that reserve and, and sort of creates this, this protected area. Again, these are quite easy to think about. You know, William Wordsworth and the Lake District, and Adams and uh, uh, Yosemite. You know, those sort of interactions we get which, which bring a protected area into being. So this is the first part of our framework, is understanding uh, protected areas as a spatial asset class and then a package of assets which together, and in particular configurations, generate forms of value and return on investments in them. Another big input uh, into our framework is understandings of histories of protected area policy. And uh, this graphic just shows that Protected area policy, over time, over more recent time, has uh, attained what we call policy savings. It's got right to the top of the political agenda four times. And each time it did that, there was a different interest in what assets to invest in and what returns we wanted from protected area policy. I'll just quickly run you through this. This is, called, this is policy savings on, on this side, just a, a, a sort of... Um, a, what do you call it, a scale on it. So at the top is when you know, presidents and uh, royalty are standing up and saying, we need protected areas, right? So it's at that international statesman level. In the middle, uh, the bureaucrats and scientists, people like me, not the bureaucrats and scientists, uh, saying, yeah, we need protected areas. And then at the bottom is the community, citizens, NGOs, community groups, saying, yeah, we want protected areas because we want that value to come for them. And in my view, when you've got them all together, you've really got a powerful cultural force which goes behind protected area policy. And we can pin all of the protected areas to one or more of these movements. So, um, for instance, do any of you go to the Lee Valley in London? Do you know that? Nice protected area. You can probably think about that, actually, as that package of assets if you walk down the Lee Valley in London. This arises from the parks movements, the nature development era of conservation, where the investments in protected areas were to generate value for society, generate value for citizens, quality of life, and as a place like the Lee Valley, generate image, green image for, for cities, uh, and so forth. An earlier, um, actually the New Forest, I was down in the New Forest at the weekend, it's a really good one to think about this, because the New Forest is a 900-year-old protected area. I won't start way back. But it started off as a hunting reserve for William the Conqueror, and then as a forest reserve to build our galleons. So this was, first of all, a natural resource reserve. Yeah? It was set up for natural resources, timbers and so forth. Then it became, a, uh, when uh, biodiversity came in, it started being a biodiversity reserve, but then its, its value changed over time, and it was reframed as the main value they wanted from that was recreation, which is what we get out of it at the moment. So here we've got protected areas, some which are, which are just building over time. Some protected areas have had multiple investments for different forms of value over time. So what are those forms of value? This is the second part of our framework, which is really saying what forms of value do protected areas generate and who captures that form of value or who can capture that form of value. This is actually quite an old slide at the moment. This is something we put together in November. I could do an update uh, of it, but actually we're beginning to think that our framework really works when you don't specify this too much. People take it for their own context. You remember that point about value being situated, and they think it through and apply it and develop it uh, in their own area. But basically, we're seeing broad things. So, you know, what forms of value do protected areas generate? natural resources and cash, or just you know, political power in the case of Britain, I just told you that one with the uh, new forest, ecosystem services very much in flow. A big one, and one which keeps coming up over time, is status and prestige, national uh, identity, with that great iconic uh, reserve. Or we can make, you know, we think about this, we make sense of Britain. If I asked you just to say the geography of Britain, you might go to London, Manchester, Birmingham, up over there, uh, Edinburgh, and so forth, then you go Lake District, Norfolk Broads, Exmoor. Just, just ways of how people make sense of space. Protected areas are really good in that area. We know the forms of value it, it generates in terms of outdoor pursuits. And protected areas are fantastic for that. And this, you know, leading all to the health benefits. And also moral and scientific expression. And these forms of value can be captured by different groups within society. Natural resources, you know, economic and enterprises, na nations and polities, everyday citizens, 
but also organisations. You know, a lot of NGOs capture value from being uh, engaged in protected areas. So that's the second part of our framework. What forms of value can investments in those assets generate and who can capture that value? An important question. But the second bit, uh, the sort of elaboration on this, and the slide's not so nice, you can see this is more, more uh, uh, sort of recent thinking, is the realisation that those with policy and investment power can generate forms of value that can benefit their cause, their constituencies, their organisation, or themselves. So this, this investment is a sort of, in that sense, it's a political thing. So, you know, that last slide is saying, OK, we've got protected areas, package of assets, what forms of value are they generating now and for whom? And what forms of value could be generated and for whom? But then there's this other question, uh, what forms of value are wanted and who decides? Absolutely, it's absolutely clear amongst politicians, now, this is very much coming from Brazil, that they don't want protected areas just sat there, they want protected areas to generate economic value, to generate money and jobs from them. You know, they're powerful people. The other one's question is, what investments are needed so public... Oh, sorry, just, just on this one. This is interesting. When we apply this framework and we apply it to that last phase of biodiversity policy, uh, biodiversity area policy, which is biodiversity, it does throw up some rather uncomfortable um, insights on this. And one of those insights is that biodiversity policy and framing protected areas as biodiversity was really pushed by scientists who needed to bring up the, the, their discipline, ecology, bring up this policy power of this discipline. And maybe the main people who are, who are benefiting from biodiversity reserves are people like me, professionals, yeah? scientists. We can see we've got loads of, you know, I directed biodiversity MSC. You know, uh, scientists, policy makers, and consultants seem to be really capturing value from that framing uh, of protected areas. So it's not a totally comfortable framework that's for people such as yourself. It does you know, reflect back uh, on what we're all doing. But the other bit which is missing from that side which I just put up there is the recognition that it's not just protected areas, it's not just investment protected areas, protected areas generate value and then people can capture that value. But many people need to be, uh, um, there needs to be investment in people to help them to capture that value. Also, organisations have been very good at capturing value from protected areas, but citizens may need transport links, they may need marketing, they may need to feel that you know, going to protected areas is cool and trendy if they're actually going to start capturing that value from it. So there's a, there's a, a sort of inward uh, angle to that uh, framework slide as well. This slide is the next part, which is saying, OK, so if we want to invest in protected areas to generate value, and we've decided who we want to generate value for, and it's not just ourselves, hopefully, uh, how might we invest in that? It's a very flat part of the framework uh, at the moment. It's just saying, well, you know, here we've got human assets, infrastructure assets. These are the sorts of types of investments we might look at. But that point that value is in networks and in relations is really important, because what we're now starting to think about this is what package of assets, general, sorry, what package of investments in what type of investable things creates value. So it's starting to link up, you know, this and this and this and this, and build these network maps of investments to generate value out of protected areas. The last part of the framework was this idea of, uh, so, that, you know, let's think about protected areas. We can think about protected areas as assets, which can generate all sorts of form of value. They're not all the same. Actually, maybe some of the value that they're generating is, uh, is going to particular groups, and it's losing political support, or so forth. This is the traditional way of thinking of risks to protected areas. You know, land encroachments, local conflicts, um, you know, uh, regulatory change, and so forth. That's traditionally how we think about it. We're now starting to think about it over from this side, in terms of what we might call risk management or how we might sort of engage with protected areas and, and where different forms of risk might form from. So I'll just pick up on two of these. One is this um, idea of adaptation investments. And I touched on that earlier with that waves graph. The idea that protected areas and the value they generate is in relation to where society is at the moment. 
So we may have uh, invested in protected areas for that infrastructure 30 years ago, but science society has moved on. So just with that new forest example, we can adapt how we invest in protected areas. So protected areas are generating value for 2030 uh, and, and beyond. An idea of adaptation investment. But also we've started focusing in a little bit on management plans, which I'll, I'll just give you an example of some research we've been doing um, in the moment. This is really saying that um, the people responsible for protected areas, uh, you know, the people governing them, managing them, should want, to, should want to know what's out there, actually what have they got as an asset and what value could be generated and who could benefit from that value. So capture value generation. They need to be managing the risks, but also they need to balance the trade-offs between uh, what value is generated and who benefits. Might be some groups who want a wilderness experience, don't want anybody there, they want the wilderness values, whereas the trade-off with that is, you know, maybe if it's close to an urban area, all the people who just want to pile out and bomb around on the mountain bikes now can't do that. So how do you bring about those, uh, how do you bring about those uh, trade-offs? So what we're doing in Brazil at the moment, and uh, Brazil has a great institutional asset, it's got a platform and they've organised all the data about their protected areas. And one of the things we've we've really started focusing in on is an institutional asset associated with protected areas, which is the management plan. Under all the guidelines and regulations, every protected area has to have a management plan. And this a management plan is what, uh, it's a, a legal instrument, tends to be, that situates protected area management. You look at what you've got, and then you decide how to, how to manage it. But what we're finding when we're looking at Brazilian management plans, there's 280 of them, which we've, uh, well, we're still going through them, but we've got, the main, uh, uh, we've got the main gist out of this, is that these management plans are almost just like, oh yeah, we need to do that. We tick them, you get a consultant in, it's done in a very formulaic way, it tends to focus on what bits of nature they are and how to manage that nature, you know, just to keep it there, without really thinking about what form of value uh, it, it can generate. Actually, although we have a guideline that you need to do a management plan, there is no framework, no new conceptual framework or guidelines for how you might do them. There's a few around, but they're very old. We're beginning to think that this, this asset framework, which I'm talking about, just asking those series of questions I've just run through, could be a really powerful way of actually framing how we do an, a management plan. So if you like it, a management plan moves more from a management plan of nature to a management plan of the reserve as an asset for uh, society, um, you know, to, to make the link between the assets, the value, liabilities, and the intended beneficiaries uh, clear. And once we start doing that, we can then move up to the next level and start thinking, well, on our reserve system, what are the different assets we've got? You know, that, that reserve, my goodness, you know, it's right next to Sao Paulo. I mean, there is a reserve right next to Sao Paulo, which is a biodiversity reserve, and nobody's allowed in it. Hmm. That seems to me to be a bit odd when actually the citizens of Sao Paulo could do with some outdoor recreation. Parts Canada is an interesting one, uh, where their reserves are too far away, their national parks are too far away from the cities for anybody to get to them. So they're not really providing that. So you can think about how you can reconfigure how you uh, manage your overall protected area estate to optimise the value which comes from it. You know, money, is, money is in short supply. And thinking about this optimization, which we think we can get through this framework, could be really, really useful. Here's another um, application uh, of the framework, which uh, was done by uh, Natalie Page, um, an MPhil student uh, in our department and, and in my lab. And here we had a look at a, a human asset. So, um, I don't know whether any of you know Manchester. Um, Oh, there's a nodding over there. South Manchester, along the Mersey Valley. This is Chalton Water Park. If you've gone there in 1975, this was a borrow pit to build the M63 motorway. And, uh, uh, well, that was a load of rubble put in it. And then if you just looked over there, you'd have seen an open tip. Uh, you just went a bit further. It's absolutely enormous asbestos tip. If you went a bit further, there's a big tips where they put all the bonsite uh, clearance in it. It was a mess. This big strip along one of our, uh, you know, along south of one of our major cities, which, you know, was a, was a tip. But Manchester being Manchester, thought, well, it's land, 
It's an asset. Let's do something with that asset. Let's generate value from it. And they re-greened it, brought countryside in, but also they made, a, made yeah, quite a decent investment in a human asset, a countryside warden service. This warden service was set up in 1978, and it was disbanded in 2013. So we thought, all oh, right, let's have a look at that. Let's actually look at that asset. And, you know, of course, there's, there's a public outcry when it was disbanded. Is that right or not? What Natalie came up with was really nice, actually. She came up with this concept of the value plateau. And I think this is right, which really explains this. It's quite useful to, just as an example of how this framework can get us thinking. So what did the world and service do? What value did it create? It comes down to one word, really, presence. They created a presence in this tip land, in this, and, you know, there was the badlands, nobody dared going in there. By being there and getting to know it, they shaped the landscape of it, but people felt confidence to come in and give guided walks, interpretation. So that land was then reclaimed by the citizens. So uh, over time, they were generating forms of value which became normalised. You know, the idea that you can go out for a walk in, in, the, in the Mercy Valley. You can go on an educational thing there. You can go, you know, do water sports there. You can go fishing there. All of these sorts of, of things. It also created value in terms of Manchester's identity. 1975, Manchester was on its knees. It needed to move from an industrial economy to a knowledge-based economy. And as we know, strategic human resource management, people stay longer in cities and in companies where there's nice places around them, green, green space. But the interesting thing about this value thing, and this was shown, is that in the early days, the investment in the warden service was generating massive value creation in all of those things I've just talked off about. But then over time, that value creation from the warden service plateaued off. Partly because people weren't scared to go down there anymore. So having wardens you know, driving around in, in Land Rovers didn't really need it. They were, you know, all become normalised. The badlands had gone. Partly also because a lot of other groups came in to generate that value. The British Trust for Conservation volunteers started doing the land management work. Forest schools started doing the education work. The RSPB has now moved in and does the sort of interpretation work. So because it comes normally, that value is spread out into the community. But what this really shows for me is that if you want to do a good investment in generating value from protected areas, in the early days of protected areas, actually knowing investing in your warden service is a good investment, but it will tail off. It's a bit like, um, I mean, I, I don't know whether you'd agree with this, for me it's a bit like, if, if you guys in the banking world, the asset management world, are investing, you want to know who your fund manager is. It's the same thing, if you've got a good protected area management, a dynamic protected area team, it will generate lots of value. But maybe over time, that's, you know, the value it can generate tails off and then the team uh, declines. Quite a different way of thinking about uh, protected areas. And for me, just finishing up, sort of uh, taking the phrase of um, uh, the week, what's it, devolution, revolution. This is suggesting that actually maybe we need this in conservation. We need to get people like me out of their suits and back to managing our protected area uh, assets. So I think I'll leave it there. That's okay. Great. Okay, so I'm going to be very quick before we, um, we move on to the panel discussion. Um, so, these are just two other ways in which we think our framework could be applied. Paul talked about manner of planning and also kind of prioritization, optimization with finite public funds. Um, one of the things uh, that we think with an asset asset based framework that is appealing is of course that it allows us to think a bit about how we can get um, private finance into protected areas to address this funding shortage. Um, so one of the things that we're thinking about developing um, is a way of um, helping uh, private investors to and, and, and impact investors to find um, viable projects within protected areas and protected area networks globally. So you've got you've got investors looking for opportunities in the space uh, for a whole range of reasons, um, but how can they find financeable projects that are going to deliver a return um, for, for their investment? Um, and they're going to be certain, you know, financeable projects are going to need certain characteristics, they're going to need, the, so we're looking at monetizable values here, they're going to need cash flows, they're going to have to have certain forms of governance arrangements, you need institutions, um, and obviously they're, they're, 
you know, one of the reasons investors want to put money into these things is they can deliver conservation outcomes and other social outcomes. So how, how, how can you identify those um, outcomes? So one of the things that we could do is to bring together um, data sets that perhaps NGOs um, and country um, protected area networks might have on the characteristics that protected areas have um, and through that process identify particular protected areas or opportunities within specific protected areas that could be financeable. Because if you've got thousands upon thousands of protected areas and thousands upon thousands of possible possible things that could be financed or invested, you need to you need to be able to search through that very quickly and originate, find viable projects, narrow it down so that you can concentrate on identifying possible investment opportunities and then do the due diligence on them on them and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's one, one thing we think this framework could help with. And then the, the second thing is around um, reputational risk management um, and uh, financial institutions um, do find it quite difficult to, uh, to turn in and identify reputational risk, particularly companies that work in and around protected areas and, and specifically here we're thinking about extractive industries, natural resources companies and so on. Um, now reputational risk is very significant because it can impact the viability of individual projects, it can have an impact on brands, you just have to look at BW, um, you can, it can obviously have impact on firms, on firms in other ways in terms of morale, it can affect investment, and cost of capital, um, all that stuff. So, so can we create a way to help investors identify activities that companies are doing that could put them at more risk from reputational risk? And could that then generate flags for engagement, questions that could be asked by uh, investors of natural resources companies working in and around protected areas? This work builds on um, work that has been done, is being done with WWF and others around World Heritage Sites. But we think um, we can, one, uh, apply it to all protected areas, and two, use some novel big data techniques to help identify which protected areas might generate the most reputational risk. So you can, you can look uh, through the internet and you can, you can see which protected areas might have more salience than others. So some protected areas, like Barunga, for example, have people will have some sort of connection with it, will know about it. If you're messing around with that kind of protected area, well, you, you might then be more at risk from some sort of event that happens that results in, in a reputational risk. Wrong a, a good example of, of that, obviously. And so Paul um, and the project and others have been thinking about how we can use some of these big data techniques to help identify um, reputational risk associated with, with activities around protected areas. So that's another possible application. Um, now, Paul gave us a fantastic overview of the framework. Here's a summary slide. I didn't propose to go through it. The slide will be available, the slide deck will be available after the talk. So I think we should probably move on to discussion. Over to Paul. Now we put together a, a small panel to uh, discuss these issues, and I'll just ask the panelists to come forward, and if we could just sit up here, um, and uh, sort of more, more informally than formally uh, discuss the issues. Yeah, down, down here, uh, Glenn, if you would. So, so what we thought we'd do is we'd just go down the table, uh, a brief introduction, who you are, uh, and your take on the issues, and then um, if we get that done with dispatch, we'll then sort of maybe even have a, have an argument about the issue. So, um, <laughs> Glenn, if you could lead, lead off. Okay, thank you, uh, and thank you, Ben and Paul, for that um, rapid and and um, all embracing summary of, of different kinds of assets and ways of thinking of things. I think three things have come to my mind uh, listening about that and, and looking at the, the outside world uh, beyond this room. Um, I think there's a couple of key frameworks and probably a third one. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment 
was interesting in trying to look at different values of the ecosystem. I thought it was most helpful in bringing cultural issues in, and many of the assets you've been talking about would fall into the cultural category. And I think it's interesting because if we want to talk about human behavior and government policy, which I was asked to sort of make a nod towards, although I'm from WWF, um, when uh, Mr. Osborne uh, decided in the uh, coalition parliament early on to sell off the woodlands in the UK, no one really said, well, if you add up how much wood there is there and who's going to buy it and so forth, we shouldn't do it. Nobody said that. Everybody said, this is outrageous. This is part of our national heritage. You may not do it. Uh, and I think there, in that sense, the cultural uh, value was a key part of influencing decision making. And no one went into the provisioning or the, any other economics. So I think that's, that, that's important for us. I think we've got an issue uh, that natural capital debates are rising up the agenda, for example, in the UK. They tend to fail to incorporate the cultural values that the ecosystem assessments had. They jumble up stocks and flows, uh, which drives everybody mad. Um, and I just, uh, just back from Manchester, since uh, we got a thumbs up from Manchester earlier, uh, Conservative Party conference, um, Rory Stewart, the minister, new minister speaking, uh, National Farmers Union speaking. So we talk about natural capital, how are we going to do a better job of not losing it all? And I would incorporate protected areas in that. And it just was uh, salutary to remember that the UK has a fantastic national ecosystem assessment, probably one of the best in the world, high reputation. Uh, but from the National Farmers Union perspective, uh, you can have all this economics going on, but frankly, if you can't go into Milton Keynes market and sell your carbon that has been part of the valuation of your land, it doesn't really help the farmer much and his behavior. Against which, of course, no farming is possible without the common agricultural policy. So what do you subsidize and how do you convert the economic and the non-economic decision making? I think UK gives some interesting examples to look at and it might be worth playing that back. So that's one. I won't take long. Um, the second piece is we will need to keep looking outside of protected areas. For two reasons. Firstly, um, they're not enough in their own right to maintain the sort of biodiversity and ecosystem services we want. I'm intrigued uh, that if we don't take a landscape context, firstly, managing your risks becomes very difficult. Um, and I, again, looking at decision making, so let, let's take China and the middle and lower Yangtze, that's 2,000 kilometers. Uh, WF China, colleagues have been working on it for about 12 years, and 150 protected areas have been established along that 2,000 kilometer stretch in a three year period. They don't muck about when they decide to do something over there. And that was about spreading risk. We know that climate is going to influence waterways. We're not sure how or where. So let's spread the risk and have those protected areas network all the way along. And that was the decision making that influenced those choices. And I think there's a bit of dynamism and the change, particularly climate change, with many other changes, the protected area thinking is going to have to take into account, particularly for future investments. Um, and finally, Third point, keep it simple. I think the assets is a, is a great framework, but from that you need to pull out key triggers for decision making. I think you indicated the sort of world heritage status of protected areas is a fundamental thing that, for example, the investment community would like to know. 
And if they've got to go through 200 and we add them all up and come up with a number, I don't think it'll help decision making. I think it'll be too complicated. So how do we apply kind of brain work to big data to pull out what's most useful? So I think those, anyway, you know, it's great work and, and those are just uh, my three bits of feedback. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Therese Niklasson. I head up uh, ESG, globally at Investec Asset Management, which is, uh, we originate from South Africa, so we've got uh, heritage, obviously, across Africa and a lot of interest in, in that continent. Um, my perspective is perhaps a bit different from some of the other panelists in the sense that we are a, very much a mainstream asset manager investing for institutional investors, pension funds, etc. So for us, it's all about integration, and I think this particular topic... Um, um, is something that hasn't received that much attention uh, over the last couple of years. I mean, we've looked at land management and those kind of issues, but we haven't unpacked it to this degree. And I think sometimes it takes a, a particular case to come up that is controversial for it to actually grab our attention. And uh, it, it's interesting talking about salience because when those cases come up, we approach the portfolio managers and they often know about them, but they don't necessarily understand how to think about value in that regard and that's where the sort of ESG process is quite valuable to sort of work with them to, to highlight some of these risks. Um, so from our perspective it was very uh, useful and important to work with WWF for example to look at how we can get the right information and data to, to make sort of more informed decision around this space because it's actually not as widely available as you might think and I think even trying to define what a protected area would be and what kind of you know, protection that, that they would require actually was a debate that had not really taken place, which is why we kind of decided to go down the World Heritage Site route. And um, it, it was a very valuable project in the sense that there are lots of different agendas, um, I think, in the space from different actors and stakeholders and share a lot of commonalities across these agendas. But um, I think in, in terms of the outcomes, there are different sort of strands of works that need, need to happen. So in this case, coming together uh, as investors with, with WWF, for example, to get an idea of what the overlap with uh, a particular industry was, was, was quite uh, informative so that we can then go away and do our work for our stakeholders with companies directly to get an idea of how can we get better information, how can, you know, what is the rationale for committing to a, a, a sort of a, a statement, a no-go commitment essentially by some companies and, and, and not others. Uh, it's going to be quite a, a valuable sort of piece of work for us to do. So I'm happy to talk about that space. Hi, uh, Andre Abadie. I look after environmental and social risk at J.P. Morgan. Um, I'm going to touch on a few things that Paul and Ben already articulated. Um, and, and even though I wear a risk management hat, I think there are two strands to this conversation. There is the, the value piece, which obviously from an investment perspective has the, the returns and, and the monetary aspect. But of course, the flip side of the coin, as, as Ben articulated, is the actual risk management side of it, if you will. And... I think the picking up on, on the point around integration and, and decision making, actually trying to define what it is you're you're looking at, um, it is a challenge again from both sides of, of so the opportunity, the value perspective, and the risk perspective. Um, Paul spoke about I'll pick up two of the points: framing, and I think framing is is one of the key issues here because as a banker. And certainly as an investment banker, you, you seldom look at single assets or single projects. Companies clearly are an aggregation of a number of projects. So when we're looking at an investment or we're looking at underwriting a transaction, you're always looking in aggregate at the corporate or the company. You very seldom get down to the specific asset. Unless there's an obvious negative issue related to it. Virunga is the perfect example. Unless there was a tension around Virunga, Frankly, would any investors or any bankers really have visibility over the issue? The answer is no. Um, and I think this is part of the challenge when, when you're looking to try and scale up the right investments into these types of areas. You, you absolutely need to, to try and aggregate that up into something that's more consumable, where you can actually make a more informed decision around, okay, of the thousands, to use Ben's example, of the thousands of assets out there that are worth protection, 
Do you aggregate them up into, a, into regions where it's more obvious that you can manage something more holistically? The Brazilian example, I think, was one that was given. Do you find a corporate which has an interest in country, which is able to piece different assets together so you have a more holistic management approach? Um, or are there other approaches? Do you actually have investors that themselves are interested in, in trying to come up with, with a framework? And, and for those that don't know, we've invested 5 million US dollars in something called NatureVest, which is uh, the Nature Conservancy's vehicle, to actually try and find where there are investable opportunities that have um, certainly environmental or biodiversity outcome or benefit. And one of the examples that, that we've seen is, is what is called the Western Checkerboards, which, as I suggest, is actually trying to parcel together different parts of Montana and Washington, where there are disparate assets which, as, as you aggregate or collect them up, do have um, more value attached to them. And I think it's that aggregation or that collection, if you will, that is part of the challenge here. Um, and, and it is an issue that, that we certainly are grappling with within the NatureVest con um, context. So framing is, is an issue that Paul brought up. And I think another issue Paul mentioned was around policy and investment power. And I think that, that to me is absolutely key as well. Because unless you have the governmental interest in actually trying to drive the right investment into protecting some of these areas, it's going to be very difficult to expect corporates or investors to be able to provide that leverage or that drive. Um, so the fact that Brazil is doing this, I think, is, is a very important example of how this can be done more effectively. And one would suggest if there is the right management, again, Paul, to use your example, if there is the right management framework in place, and the Brazilian government, for instance, is serious about, about making sure that there is an aggregate, again, I use that term, a, a more collective management approach, then that is something that I certainly think investors would be um, quite interested in. Um, and I think underpinning all of that, of course, is, is the concept of value, as we've heard throughout th this evening's discussion, and, and indeed value to whom. Uh, and this is where NatureVest again comes into the discussion, because we are trying to define where there is a cash flow that is investable. And what is that cash flow? What is, what is the value that, that is actually being underpinned? Um, so again, just stealing from Paul's uh, ideology or framework, if you will, so the framing piece, the power piece, and, and then actually trying to define what the actual value is. And as I said, I think the flip side of that, to, to pick up on some of Ben's later points, is, is the obvious risks that go with that. And the challenge for us from a risk management perspective, again, are that we don't, as, as a financial institution, manage risks at an individual level. You manage them in aggregate. So if we're looking to take a company to market, um, we'll look at the entire corporate and all of the assets that it may have. Um, so it's quite difficult for us to, to dive into a specific asset like a Virunga and try and uh, manage that specifically. Um, I do think that the tool, financial institutions use a number of tools to try and get a spatial idea of where value is, where there's value at risk and where there is actual um, risk issues at play. So I think this tool certainly has a lot of mileage in the sense that if it does present to us um, both the point around aggregation, so what are the what's the hierarchy of value, if you will, and, and, and where are the most important assets that we should be looking at, whether that's uh, collectively or, or individually, but also trying to define from a reputation risk point of view, picking up on Ben's point, if there are assets that we should be thinking about uniquely and individually, Great Barrier Reef in Australia is almost an obvious one, where you've probably seen a lot of attention around the natural resource development, whether it's um, a lot of the coal developments in the Galilee Basin, which may be exported through the Great Barrier Reef, or whether it's a lot of the LNG facilities around Curtis Island, <clears throat> there you have some more obvious, tangible um, value at risk, if you will, and reputation risk issues. But that's almost too obvious. You know, are there others that we aren't aware of, and how can this tool be used to, to bring those to the surface? So I'll stop there. I, I thought what we might do is just give uh, the audience a chance to ask some questions <coughs> and uh, perhaps even challenge the authors of the report. And so I just encourage you uh, to take a moment to put up your hands if you want to. Uh, yeah. Uh, first at the back and then Robin. Yeah. Um, the, the reason I was in Manchester um, all those years ago was, to, was um, to do a PhD in philosophy on the, what it means to have ecological value and how that's different from other kinds of value. <laughs> and the, um, the difficulty was finding single metric um, of ecological value that can function in the same way that um, money does for a financial institution. 
goes through financial instruments and try and work out what the cash flows are worth to you and then make a decision based on the options available to you. You can't really do that with um, nature. Or, or what you can do is you can put someone or some collective body in the position of making that kind of decision. So you're never going to be able to say that this habitat is worth four times that habitat. But you are able to put the responsibility on somebody who can make the kind of, the kind of simple decision that um, you in the um, financial services sector are going to have to make. Because you don't have to spend more time. Yeah. Spend more time, time focusing on it. And that really then comes down to political accountability. And you need clear um, time <coughs> when value gets assessed. Uh, when I was working uh, for the Conservative Party developing policy, we, we thought the one time when that would work was when you're planning a new development. The question there is, are you going to harm any ecosystem services? And if so, how do you find ways of making sure that you replace those elsewhere? It's all about um, calculating an aggregate score, but working out what um, needs to be replaced specifically. Where something like a tool would be useful would be let's take let's take the common agricultural policy elements and land management and the rest. Find out which sources of funding can then be used to um, compensate for the damage that you, you do when pursuing some kind of project. That sort of thing can bring these things together. Okay. Um, just briefly a comment response down the panel. Start start with the authors. This is a challenge. Well, I, t I tend to agree with those uh, yeah. comments on, on value because, you know, if we're thinking of, of, of you know, I was saying that quite a lot of the value generated by protected areas is, is relational, it's co-produced. Almost by definition, you can never, you can never pin, pin it down. However, what, what, where we're at at the moment, and it'd be interesting to, um, to hear some thoughts on this, is, is saying, well, we can get metrics uh, with, with using big data techniques. We can get, I mean, very preliminary, but metrics of cultural Ness or iconicness, so iconicness associated with species or culturalness associated with a site, and we can get that from internet visibility, and we can also start getting the geographies of, of internet visibility. So although quite crude, we can start uh, creating relative indices of, of, of proxies for, um, for maybe what that, uh, what that re relational, um, relational value is. Also, then maybe just just thinking about this more aggregated thing. I think I think where where when we talk about great protected areas, they always seem to be ones which have been sort of co-produced at a time and in a place, and have become part of that. So of course, it's quite hard to aggregate or compare that value between places. But again, you can actually you can actually measure that or get an assessment of that. So there's the protected areas which have just been produced, created through a bureaucratic process, and there's those protected areas which have been uh, created more through more a you know some sort of dynamic. So I, th I think I mean I, I totally agree with, with value, but I think we can get some useful metrics which might help the sort of uh, more portfolio decision making uh, we're, we're doing. Right from here on in, I'm going to ring the bell when Sorry. the question's too long. <laughs> And they the bell when the answer's too long. So, Robin? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, off you go, your question. Thank you. I, it seems to me that the move from the conceptual to the useful, uh, you probably need to define who the audiences are, otherwise you're left with you know, a very high level and you won't be talking to all people the time. I was struck the gent from Hermes this morning saying that he noticed that uh, the Volkswagen has scored lowly on their ESG index and of course with hindsight he could have told us the Volkswagen was a trip over. I do think there is certainly some um, future in the sort of protected area index you are talking about enormously difficult, totally controversial, I suspect, is what the outcomes would be, but there are obviously a whole lot of red, iconic places, whether it's Runga, you know, I'm so glad that Shell went out of the Arctic, because they were never, ever going to maintain their reputation in any sense at all as being even slightly interested in the environment while they were there. 
um, so that you can have the, the iconic for the um, pure red, and you can get orange and so on and so forth. But I do think that thinking who is the audience and creating something that they can actually use will be quite a useful next step. Mm -hmm. Okay, I take that as a comment. Um, next question, question over there. I, be, before the questions posed, I might observe this, that it's interesting that German investors understood actually what the metrics showed and had disinvested from Volkswagen. Uh, Anglo-American investors had used the metrics but had no knowledge by which to interpret the metrics and had remained invested. All couldn't care less. Yes, all couldn't care less. <laughs> well, but if you're a German investor disinvesting from Volkswagen, that's a big statement. I'd be interested to understand what biodiversity offsetting um, comes into it. Um, we're working with quite a lot of oil and gas and mining companies and increasingly um, these companies, they consider biodiversity offsetting because it's a lender, a lender finance requirement. Um, when, they, you know, when they're developing a project and they're going to be moving into an area of forest, um, and, you know, when they find out that as a lot of the IC performance standards, they, they need to do something to mitigate the damage they need to cause to a forest area, then um, biodiversity offsetting is increasingly the tool that's used to mitigate um, the impact. And some companies do it because of a, of a reputational issue, some do it because of finance, a few want to do it because they want to create, they're interested in uh, increasing you know, their value rather than just kind of as a mitigation strategy. So I'd like to know kind of where, you know, in that framework you've been talking about, the value creation, etc., where does sort of biodiversity offsetting come into that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, Biodiversity offsetting, in my mind, I mean, tell me wrong, it's a bit like this idea of aggregate natural capital, that we've got a stock of biodiversity, and if we damage it, we can, we can replenish that stock somewhere else. So we either you know, move our nukes or create a new, new pump, or whatever. So I'll tell you where my thinking is right at the moment, that you may or may not know that um, uh, rewilding, the concept of rewilding, is a big new paradigm in conservation. It's got a lot of take up in the UK. It's exciting. It's a positive environmentalism. So what this thinks about is rather than seeing biodiversity in a resource way as a stock of capital, which we need to move, we could say, well, if we're damaging biodiversity, rather than offsetting in in you know, keeping the aggregate amounts of biodiversity the same as biodiversity. Why don't we just invest in a totally new natural asset? Why don't we use that money? You know, all of that stuff is so complicated, you know, like for like and all of that. Forget it. Let's just invest in a new natural asset. Um, you know, a big rewild the rich way. You know, create a uh, you know a Serengeti, or not sorry, sort of a step type landscape in the UK. We don't have it. It, it, it could can create amazing value from that. So I think there is a link uh, between offset and this framework and it's about think that thinking about rather than offsetting like for like, let's invest in a new asset or in a different asset. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so of course uh, how do you avoid biodiversity offsetting being a license to trash is your fundamental question. Um, and the whole uh, essence of starting with biodiversity offsetting is, you know, it's just moving the damage you've done from one place to another. Um, I think fundamentally, if you can't hold people to a mitigation hierarchy in the development planning, the offsetting will always end up losing biodiversity. If they haven't tried to minimize from the outset, if they haven't tried to restore from the outset, if they haven't tried to do best practice before the residual is offset, you are just heading to the bottom. So that would be my only comment. I know you know, but I think it's worth saying. Down the back. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just occurs to me, um, Paul, particularly, I think, um, that you talked about assets in your framework, but what, you know, in traditional financial accounting, the thing that goes along with assets is liabilities. And, uh, you know, something that hasn't been talked about here is there are a very large number of people in the world who are extremely hostile to protected areas. And there are a range of reasons for that, and many people here are very aware of that, particularly around uh, in tropical uh, developing countries, 
and the point of view that um, uh, you know there are issues of equity over the establishment or maintenance of protected areas. So it seems to me, you know, that's that's a hornet's nest that can't be avoided in the debate over protected areas. And there's also a disconnect, which is that in general, in rich developed countries, there is a positive cultural outlook on protected areas, like your Mersey Valley example, um, and that doesn't necessarily translate uh, in uh, developing countries. So it seems to me um, you could do a sort of a massive service if you were able to grapple with that very thorny, tricky problem in conceptual terms in the way that you have done on the asset side. Mm. Quickly. I'm sorry. Uh, really? Okay. Just okay. To this one, um, I wonder whether the conceptual framework uh, which you developed with you presented in your report as universal, or you take into account specificities for different countries, like uh, in the Western Eastern European Middle Asian context of developed and developing countries. Whether you look at this from this perspective? Thank mm. you. Do you want to go first? Yeah. So. Um, well, let's just take that one. I, th I think that this, this one can work in all sorts of countries. We put one side up of the Tatra Mountains from Eastern Europe. You can just see how early investments in the Tatra Mountains have generated value for Slovakia, both you know, through the communist era and now as it's, as it's growing up. So I think that the framework can apply uh, in many different places. It depends on you know, what your biophysical assets are. And what they're like and what forms of value can be generated from them. We absolutely know that tropical forest is quite difficult to generate forms of recreational value from. Photographic value, mm, not as good as the Tatra, uh, Tatra mountains. So going back to um, this question of, of liabilities, I think, Bernard, what you were getting at is, is more the sort of um, uh, political liability of disenfranchisement um, or whatever. For me, what this asset framework does, that bit about saying what forms of value are the protected area there for and for whom, makes the whole thing clear and transparent. And then people can either argue against that or not. I worked in Indonesia for a long time, you know, one million, two million hectare reserves set up for biodiversity. Of course you're going to annoy people, A, because they're really big, and B, because that's the, well, it's the same in Brazil, actually. You know, this whole biodiversity metric, it means something for the, you know, in these tiered societies, for the elite, the people who are up there, and this is their territory which they're imposing on you. So I think this does reground it, um, and, you know, I think it is a challenge for bureaucratic elites to say, well, you know, who are these protected areas um, for? When you're dealing with land, you, you're never going to get away from controversy, though, when you're dealing with land, because there's always going to be someone who wants to do something different with it. it for me, it's about re-democratising protected areas and making the values and the forms of value explicit and which people can talk about. But it's also about... Are you going to knock it? Just, I'll tell you another story, then. So, uh, I, lived, I lived in Bogor outside Jakarta for years, and I went up to... Um, there's this fantastic protected area, Gunungede, and you climb it and you go up this and there'll be hundreds of students coming up with you. You know, University of Indonesia, you have to climb to the top of the mountain. There was no infrastructure put in them for them at all. You know, it was a really tough walk and it wasn't very pleasant. Such that when you got to the top, you weren't really getting that full value. But if that infrastructure had been put in, that protected that whole conservation, I think, would have started getting embedded more in Indonesian society because they'd have taken the kids up, they'd have gone there with families or whatever. So I think I don't think this is just a rich country thing. I think it does apply, um, you know, to many different countries. Can I just quickly add something to that, which is that, you know, I think our framework is one of the things it can do is give protected areas a voice in conversations and processes that you know, about contestation and how, and the trade-offs within landscapes, right? So I think one of the things that protected areas haven't had, um, they, aren't, they aren't really competing in the same way with other, other land uses. You know, you can look at other land uses and you can, you can know that somebody's making profits from a particular activity or people are, you know, uh, have livelihoods associated with it, whereas protected areas are sort of a, a largely voiceless and I think if we can create you know, the part of the framework is to is, is to give voice to to the things that they're co contributing to a landscape and also to identify help identify connections between 
the values that are protected area, protected areas generating and how that's related to the values that are being generated by the land uses because they're obviously into relationships and having a framework can help you understand those 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 connections there's a question down the front oh yeah uh, well uh, first of all this is all this is all brilliant stuff and it's great um i just wanted to ask about uh red and or red plus and how that fits in with this because i was fascinated by this merseyside story of the, of the rapidly increasing asset of value created by investment which you know, which then sort of plateau not after a while. But it's that it's that mechanics of, of what happens in those few years at the beginning when the protect area is being created in people's minds and societies, which in you know, somewhat like the media, translates into all those sort of little sort of engineers being set up and nature clubs the universities mm. being blah blah blah. All that stuff. The red system seems to be Yes, yes, is my question. How do we make the whole red mechanism think longer term? Because it's, it's just there about short term interventions that start the, seem to start the process of creating that value and then push off. So how do we, how do we lock these, these investments longer term into um, the creation of the tax area, which is effectively what red is, is about? It's not very clear. I'm not quite sure what to uh, what to say on that. I mean, um, uh, what, one of my uh, lab, Mary Mulyani, did a really nice piece of work looking at red investments in, in Indonesia. And uh, one of the things she found is that, well, a very positive thing is that actually when you're doing policy investments, you never quite, un you've got this target what you want to do, but it might do unexpected things. And she found some very positive unexpected things it did uh, in, in Indonesia relating to um, uh, political transparency. But what she also found is that when red hit the ground, because it was being targeted to projects which had already, or protected areas, areas which had already been recipients of international development aid, that the way that aid had gone in previously had created a, uh, a sense of distrust amongst communities and, and almost created an is it a negative asset? Can you have a negative asset? A liability, uh, using Bernard's word. And that was really uh, affecting the performance of, of RED. So, you know, there's history and context in, in all of these things. That, that's not quite a direct answer, but that's probably the best I can do. So, so, so two, two things come to mind. One is a, a quite an obvious point around, well, you, you know, to, to, get, to get forest conservation and red going, you need more than just a simple carbon price signal to do that. You need to make investments in a whole range of different stakeholders and all the rest of it to, to make this happen. I think that's kind of well understood. The, the problem has always been trying to make make policy behave in that way and, and understanding what little investments are needed and, and the accountability for making those investments and all that stuff that's very difficult with donors. That's one thing. The second thing is about the implication of, of, of Natalie's work and the plateau is actually around the exit strategy for, for, for red. So um, the assumption is that you keep making red payments forever, right? But you might not need to. Mm. Um, that might improve the, that might have implications for the amount of red you can afford to, to have, and, um, but it might also annoy quite a few people. Um, and it might, and, and, and presumably it does degrade over, potentially over time. I mean, that would be something. To think about and the monitoring process as well, and you know what what kind of top-up investments might be needed over time, but that seems sort of quite far into the future. Um, could I just ask you, uh, sort of frame the question this way? So, I I sit on an endowment, and there are sort of three rules that go with managing an endowment. One is conserve the value of the asset, right? So that actually you're conserving it for a generation ahead. So conservation of value is really important, which basically means that you don't go out to the margins of risk, right? You're always within the risk envelope. The second one is be conscious of not just conservation, but actually what is the rate of return that reproduces the asset in the longer term, but nonetheless gives you value that you can kind of farm out to other activities. So mm -hmm. there's conservation. Now there is basically a rate of return that is, has two purposes. One is uh, in reproduction, but the other one is in use, right? 
And the third thing about managing an endowment is in some respects that you want to be able to switch it, right? So property was great through the 17th century. Any Oxford college knows and still sits on it. It's returning 1%, right? Fantastic, but God help us, yeah? Uh, but you really might want to mobilize that asset in the longer term to switch it to other uses, right? But it seems to me when you talk about conservation areas, this is a fixed thing. And I wondered if my sort of three stages of endowment management mm. apply if, in fact, actually my friend here might actually expect that that thing is there for future generations and he's not interested in reusing it in different ways. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so when we talk about fixed thing, there is a view that protected areas should be there in perpetuity. That's quite a, an old idea within conservation. Personally, I think that's too strict that, you know, we can move protected areas around. They don't all have to be there uh, in perpetuity. That concept of, of, you know, the three things you're just saying, and I think you're saying switching thing. I'll just use an example here, which I think is a, maybe um, a good one on, on, on this. So when we looked at the, the Mersey Valley, it was financed and it was managed within the Leisure Service Department. Uh, I was down at Dilston Country Park uh, this weekend, same sort of idea, but what they're now talking about is that that asset may become managed by the social services uh, department because uh, councils in the UK are now having to take on responsibility for mental health problems, uh, depression through to dementia, and the, these uh, countryside, uh, you know, those sort of park assets are really valuable uh, in terms of, of providing services with people like that and reducing the cost to social care. So I, I think that assets can move, protected area assets can move between, if you like, use. Uh, well, use and, and, uh, and uh, governing uh, bodies uh, for them. Okay. Uh, last couple of questions. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, I would be curious to see how the framework um, would fare against some of the economic economics. So, for instance, if you look at perhaps more all the informative to in terms of nature, so you look at Brazil. You know, two years ago, Brazil's economy eclipsed uh, the size of the UK economy, which, which startled a lot of people and made headlines. To the extent now, or two years, it's completely flipped. You know, GDP has collapsed in dollar terms. Brazil is down 30% in just the dollar terms, you know, because of the reality drop in a year. So in that context, where the investment plan is completely switched, and that's the flow is drying up, um, people are, are stopping with the assets. Have you looked at this framework in the context of that? I mean, Brazil and Russia in the BRICS stand out to me because they've completely turned around, given, especially given the currency movement. India, India and China are still, you know, you could call them darlings, not so much anymore, but still kind of the same, a little bit the same story. But, Clearly, that's going to have impact on where the money is coming from and how it's going to get invested. And I just wonder whether you looked at it, especially for Brazil, because that to me is a big standout in the last year. Yeah, so we've um, looked a little bit about this, and when we're thinking about Brazilian protected area assets, uh, Brazil has actually, in part, it's established those and it's leveraged those to generate value for the nation in terms of uh, glo global standing and international uh, aid flows. Um, you know, there's a lot of money which can move into tropical conservation from, you know, Norway uh, and, and so forth. So that's how it's used. Uh, its asset. And actually the amount of money that the Brazilian government puts into protected areas is <laughs> unbelievably small compared uh, to, to the size of it. So, so I think what we're trying to, do, well, uh, what, what we're starting to do here is, is show how actually taking this as asset approach, it may be to the benefit, I mean this goes back to the earlier comment about health and so forth, for state level administrations and municipalities to start investing in, in protected areas. So we're not totally dependent on those aid flows. And actually, with, with, this, with the exemption of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, all of the aid flows are going into the Amazon. So uh, all of these other uh, protected area assets are under-resourced at the moment. Last question? Yeah, down the back. Um, so I had a question about, uh, when I saw the title of this, I thought it was going to be about the resilience of protected areas against climate change and 
um, how species might move around and that kind of thing. Um, and you mentioned stranded assets, which made me think of that. But we've mainly been speaking this evening about um, the resilience, financial resilience of protected areas and the resilience of values. And I wondered whether you could talk about the link between the resilience, the ecological resilience, and the resilience of the values and the connection there. So this is the biggest single question tonight. Actually. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> yeah, no. Good shot. The resilience of protected areas to climate change. They, they just have to be part of an adaptation uh, strategy. So, you know, some, I mean, there's so much, there's quite a lot of work going on at the moment in terms of, you know, uh, ecosystem processes and so forth and thinking uh, about, about those things. But of course, some, you know, some protected areas will, well, nature always changes, some protected areas will change. Um, yeah, so that's a sort of rather fumbling uh, answer to that, but it's, but it's not really quite in, the, in that space, this work. It's more thinking about the resilience of protected areas as a policy ideal and, and how that can be maintained. And for me, that is crucial to that question of how protected areas are going to be resilient to climate change, because if they're not resilient as a policy ideal, then the next question doesn't really matter. But I would just add that once you have an asset and you value it, you then start thinking about risk management in a different way. And so that's one of the reasons we, we did this. In fact, it started as a conversation about how do we apply stranded assets to biodiversity? And we ended up with, well, we need to, we need to create some assets first, so here's a framework for doing that. Thank you very much.